Thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to do before I start is, and you'll have to, just a couple of apologies. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's going to be impossible for me to go through the, the whole subject um, that I'm dealing with right now in sort of 20, 25 minutes. So my goal really is to provide just an outline. And I hope that that will stimulate you to ask the questions during the panel discussion to open things up. And I'll do my best to explain things in as sort of overview of, uh, Way as, or a, a way that as much of an overview as possible. Uh, but per, certainly, if I don't get things across, feel free to ask us during the, the panel discussion. And the other thing I wanted to start off with was I just remembered, as, as Jim was introducing me, one day I was talking to, I can't remember who it was, somebody about what I do. And first of all, I'm an intensive care doctor. I deal with people who are very, very ill uh, at Cornell. And basically, my job is to try to make sure that they don't die. And that if they do die, I follow them down and try and bring them back to life again. So that's basically what we do. And that's our every day. You know, it's very stressful at times, but it's also very rewarding. Um, and I was talking to somebody about sort of the subject of near-death experience. What I realized is that people have very fixed sort of perceptions of what we're talking about. And so she listened and was really interested in what I was saying. And then had this very sort of sympathetic look as she looked at me and said, how does it feel to be a doctor studying death? And I was like, what, what do you mean? I don't study death. I'm studying life. I'm studying you know, bringing people back to life again. And I suddenly realized that the perceptions that people have out there is that you know, you're like Dr. Death or something. So there were all these gray sort of clouds hovering. There was going to be a thunderstorm. Even I was about to start crying at my own sort of situation in life. I was like, what happened? How come I ended up like this? Until I had to sort of pause myself and break out of this shell myself and say, no, no, hold on. That's not the case. I'm studying the process of life like any physician. But I'm the guy who's right on that cusp. I'm on this line between life and death. And I try to make sure people don't cross it. And if they do, I try to bring them back. And people like me are doing everything they can to follow you along. And basically, we're just nosy. We won't let you go. We're going to follow you until we get you back. And, and you'll hear a bit more about that. So inadvertently, through studying the processes of bringing people back to life again, we end up studying death as well. So they kind of go together. And that's how I like to present it, that's what I really do. OK? I'm not Dr. Death. I'm Dr. Life. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> Does this work? Do you know? Right. So, and since it was so gloomy, I just wanted to start off with a quiz. Because once I heard that, I thought, you know what? I should have just been a quiz master. So if I may, and this is more for interest and also for myself, I'm just interested to hear about perceptions out there. So here we are. I'm the quiz master on TV. And I want to ask everyone a question. Now, you don't have to answer individually, but do please give me a show of hands. I'm actually really interested in, in the answers to some of these questions. So my first question to you is, is reality fixed? Are things that we perceive, are they fixed or do they change? Hands up for those who say it's fixed. Nobody. Wow, that's pretty good. How about scientific realities? Are they fixed? They're not really? Well, I used to think they were fixed. I used to think, you know, if someone taught me something, that's the way it was. That's the way it is forever. Until as I grew older, and as Jim was pointing, I realized that, you know, they changed their minds. Ten years ago, they told me something. Now they're telling me something completely different. So reality definitely isn't fixed. And if you look in history, unfortunately, we haven't got time for that. There have to be another uh, event to talk about that. But you see, everything that we have sort of assumed to be absolute, we see 50 years later is completely different. So be aware that we have to be willing to change and our attitudes and perceptions about even the most fundamental, basic things that we think we understand. So that's what I'm going to say. Now, my other question to you is, who here believes that they have a psyche? Put your hand up, those who believe they have a psyche. You don't have a psyche. Everyone who believes they have a psyche, put their hand up. Does every, is that everyone? Pretty much, I think so. It must be 98%. Good. Who has a mind? I have a mind. I'm willing to. OK. Do we have a soul? OK. Well, that's interesting. All right. OK. My other question to you is, are these terms different? Do you think, who thinks they're different, or are they the same thing? Who says they're different? OK, that's about 60, I think 70%, I would say. OK. Now, I didn't mean to ask you personal questions about your beliefs. Forgive me. But what I wanted to point out here is something that well, we'll come to in a moment. But just bear this question in mind as we go along in this. My other question to you is, now surely this, I hope, will not be so universal. Is a cardiac arrest the same as a heart attack? Those who believe that a heart attack and a cardiac arrest are the same thing, put your hands up. Are you not going to follow my lead? <laughs> OK, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. Well, most people think that a heart attack and a cardiac arrest are the same thing. I just want to tell you right now they're not. A heart attack can cause a cardiac arrest, but they're not the same thing, just so you know. Okay, And I'll explain that a bit more 
And I have a feeling that most of you, more people would have put their hands up. For some reason, you didn't, but I don't know. Because what I, I tell you, whenever I've discussed this with the media, I've spent like 20 minutes discussing it. And when they write their reports, their articles, they say heart attack victims. And I'm like, but anyway. So my other question is, is death fixed? So basically, can you be dead and alive at the same time? So those who say that death you know, is a moment, you're either dead or you're alive. Those who believe in that, put your hands up, please. So is death, by the way, I put my hands up for everything because I want to encourage you. So <laughs> don't follow me. But is death, can you be alive and dead at the same time? So is death essentially a fixed moment or not? Yes? Most people? No? 50% maybe? OK. Good. I like that. All right. So let's, uh, let's start. And one final question that came to me now. Who in this room is not a thinking being, by the way? Just, just show me who you're not. If you're not thinking, just tell me about it. So we're all thinking conscious beings too, are we? Good, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. All right. So what I wanted to do is just give you a little outline about some of the issues that Jim just discussed, um, which is the concept of the self. And um, just to make it very simple and make you just so we're on the same page again for the remainder of this talk, if you think about it, from the moment that we were born uh, and as we grew older and, you know, we started to interact with friends, parents, until throughout our entire lives we developed relationships with our parents, family, friends, etc., spouses, when we have our own children, and then careers, etc., and how we interact with people at work, and everything that we do essentially takes place through our mind and our consciousness, through this entity we call the self, right? And if we look back as we grow older, we realize that essentially we are thinking beings, and everything that all the actions that we do take place through our consciousness, our thoughts. So in fact, if you wanted to make the world a better place, you could make thoughts better, and then everything else would follow with that. We're primarily thinking conscious beings. And moreover, just to point out again, no matter what we're interested in, I'm not talking about spirituality or you know, just basic, anything basic. Whatever you're interested in in life, whether it's the arts, whether it's music, whether it's science, whether it's uh, law, you know, the judicial system, and whether it is morality and ethics, whether you believe in God, you don't believe in God, whatever your personal beliefs are, everything is mediated by this phenomena, what we were calling consciousness or the self, what we are. And one may develop certain aspects of it. For example, I'm a physician. I spent many years developing my consciousness on medicine. And I'm continuing to do that. That's one aspect. Uh, Mozart or Beethoven would have developed their consciousness in relation to music. And there are others who work in different fields. And some people are interested in developing morality, ethical behavior. So, so there are different components, but that's essentially what we are. And that's what we're talking about here. And what's interesting is that I've started doing this research because I'm getting more and more interested in this. Is actually, although we're talking about it today here at the New York Academy of Sciences with this amazing view that we'd all kill for, this is something that goes back really as far as I can tell from the beginning of time, certainly from where we have records. And if you look back, in fact, it's before ancient Greece. Um, there are sort of records and, and references to people who were studying this phenomena uh, in about four or 5,000 years ago, this sort of concept of animism. And what people had, even at that time, they've developed a model to try to explain what they were, how they were living, what their thoughts were. And essentially, they divided this concept of the self into two different components, one being something that's to do with life, and another one that's something to do with psychological functions. So psychology is not as new as we think. Even 5,000 years ago, people were thinking about how our thoughts are, where they come from, etc. And what they also were believing at some time was that some people believed that when you die, that component of you, whatever it is, dies with you. And some people believe that it continues. And this whole debate has also been going on for thousands of years as well. And essentially, at least in the Western world, our sort of knowledge really started to take off um, after there was in, so this thought started to get infused into Greek culture. And so although there was a lot of mythology, but slowly from the time of Homer, a sort of a concept began to develop about what the self is. You know, where do our thoughts come from? Where does life begin? How do life processes occur? The beginnings of biology. You know, all of this entity was, was started at the time of the Greeks. And essentially, by the time of Socrates, this concept of the self had taken on a real definitive meaning. And it really referred to everything that made people into what they were, their psychological functions. So again, psychology is not as new as we think. Uh, but also ethical, moral behavior, um, and also the question, of course, as to what happens to this entity that we call the self. And as you may know, and I'm going to simplify it grossly, but this is essentially fascinating, and this is really the way it's been from that time. There are two broad views about this. One is Plato's view that this entity that we call the self or consciousness um, 
continues even after death, that it, it's not produced by the body, but interacts with the body and continues after death. And then Aristotle, the other great philosopher, Greek philosopher, believed that this psyche, which they called the psyche, is essentially produced from the, brain, the body. It's a bodily function. And when the body dies, it also dies. So for Aristotle, the psyche, which is now called the soul in English, that's why I wanted to point that out to you, they're the same thing, this whole entity of the self, the psyche or the soul, for him, was nothing more than the perfection of the, the material body. So for example, if you think the analogy that he uses, if you think of sight, sight is the soul of the eye. So if the eye is working perfectly, you have sight, right? It's the soul, the spirit, the psyche in that relation. Now if the eye is damaged, then, or the eye dies, then of course you lose sight as well. So for him, the human psyche was nothing more than the product of the perfection of the bodily process. Somehow, this perfect body developed psyche. And therefore, when you died, that also died with you. And that's been the major difference. And if you follow that trend through thousands of years now since that time, both in Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, and then psychology and neuroscience today, that's been the dividing point. Nobody here, and thankfully in the audience we all agree, can deny that there is a psyche or a soul if you think of it in that context. But the debate comes into, does it continue living after you die? Or does it die with you? And that's basically the question that Plato had and Aristotle had. And so it's funny for me when I listen to some scientists who sort of adamantly say, oh, this is nonsense. I'm like, well, you're basically following Aristotle. And, and there are others who say, oh, no, no, I think there is something. Well, they're just following Plato. And that's what's interesting as well. And this trend has continued, and it's really taken over into modern psychology and science, as I mentioned to you as well. And so we're all interested still, 5,000 years later, into understanding what is it that makes us into who we are. Because essentially, like our ancestors, we realize that that's one of the most fundamental questions. That's how we can shape the world around ourselves and give meaning to our own lives if we understand what that entity is. So here you are. Here's a child, very confused as I was when I heard all these different terms. But essentially, you can see that these terms, and I don't want to go into these because there are different models that have been developed. You know, Freud has a model and there are various other models. But just broadly speaking, we're talking about this entity. I wish I had a little box. It's the thing that makes us into who we are, the thinking conscious beings. Okay? And it may be that it continues after death. It may not do. But these are essentially some terms that are used and have taken on different meanings with time. But broadly speaking, I'm not going to go into those in this session. And we generally now call it in science consciousness, that sense of awareness of who we are, what we are, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, everything that makes us into who we are. So ultimately, I don't want to go into the debate beyond that just to say that there is this entity, but to say that we are all conscious thinking beings. And I'm glad you all agreed with me because I can use that as supporting evidence if someone debates that with me one day. Okay? And everything that we do takes place through our mind and consciousness. Now, one of the most fascinating questions from the beginning of time has, of course, been, well, what happens to this entity that we are, this thinking? What, what happens to Sam Parnia as a thinking conscious being when he dies? Okay? And this is where I'm fascinated because I work in resuscitation science, which is essentially the science of reversing death, bringing people back to life again after they have died and trying to prevent them. And it's a field that is only 50 years old, brand new. It's progressing very rapidly, and I think it will have huge implications for everybody. So it's my real privilege to be able to give you sort of an outline, a taster of what I experience and the, the fascination that it gives me uh, looking at this particular field. Now, like the concept of consciousness, we definitely are not the first people to have thought about this. So just to point out, others also tried to reverse death before us, before modern science. And this goes back a couple of thousand years as well, at least the records that we have. So the Greek physician Garland used to associate warmth with life. And so they thought when you're dead, you're cold. So what they used to do was try to warm you up when you had died. That was the concept. Resuscitation science two and a half thousand years ago was warming someone up. Now, unfortunately, some of my colleagues complain about resuscitation. I go, oh, it's really messy. And I tell them, wait till you hear what they used to do two and a half thousand years ago. <laughs> One way was to put warm ash onto someone who died. That's not so bad, I guess, if you didn't burn your fingers. The other one was to put burning excrement onto people's bodies and try to warm them up. Now, that doesn't sound like fun to me at all. So just bear that in mind. And then others would actually whip people. So you'd whip them and try to get them stimulated and prevent them from dying. I don't think they were very successful. And I think that burning excrement business went out of fashion pretty quickly. So that's good. Then an interesting development was in the sort of 1530s, 
um, in Europe, especially because you have to realize in those days when people died, they didn't live long enough to have strokes and heart attacks. They usually died from accidents, you know, drowning. And what they realized was that if you take a fireplace bellows and you try to just pump air into someone's airway, maybe you can revive them. And that's not that dissimilar to modern ventilation that we use in the ICU. So they used to, if you died, they would take a bellows and they would pump air into you and try to revive you. Unfortunately, it wasn't that successful because they didn't have a whole science around it, as I'm discovering now. There's more to it than just pumping air in. But at least they tried, and the idea was interesting. And unfortunately, I guess they realized it didn't work very much. So after 300 years, they gave up on that idea. They tried, though, very hard. Other things have been done, and this is just a little summary. It's fascinating. Fumigation. Um, they used to blow smoke into your backside after you died. Again, hoping to stimulate you. I'm not sure how that was supposed to work. But again, it was worth a try, I suppose. The other things that people do, which is actually not that crazy if you think about it, they used to put you on a barrel and then roll you, which sounds crazy, right? Or they'd put you on a horse and get the horse to trot, hoping that you'd be revived. Now, I thought that was completely crazy until I realized the rationale behind this was that when the horse was trotting, your chest would move up and down with that process. So they hadn't quite figured out they could just press on the chest. They had the horse do it. I guess they were lazy. They were aristocratic. They are like, you know, let the horse do it. So again, it didn't work. And then until really after the Second World War, and I don't know how this sort of eventually came to somebody, that you can do manual chest compressions to try to stimulate the heart and give mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. And that was the beginning of modern resuscitation science. It was just a very simple observation, but it's completely changed all our perceptions of life and death, as you'll see. So be grateful that you are not living too far ago. And this is what it's led to now. Okay, This was a front cover of Newsweek, 2007. It features a whole array of research that's being done in this field and, and includes some of the work that we're doing as well. And this headline is not incorrect. Most headlines are a little bit too much. This is actually absolutely correct. This person had died, was absolutely dead, and he's not dead anymore. So how can that be? How can you be dead but not be dead? It doesn't make any sense, right? And the reason for that is because our perceptions of death are based upon those old times, you know? So that when you watch Hollywood, and that still continues, when you watch movies, you know, your hero gets shot, right? And then he goes, like, he's a hero, of course. He's like, no, go, go. And then he just goes, ah, oh, and then he's dead. And you all say, oh, he's dead now. You know, my hero died, right? But that thing is, that's like the 19th century. That's so old-fashioned. It doesn't, it's not true anymore, you know? Death is completely reversible. In fact, what I'm seeing in the future, and not too distant future, we can reverse any death in, in the not too distant future. And the point is, that it is not static. So it is not, there is no moment of death anymore. It's not like you can, and even when we're in the hospitals, and if you talk to my colleagues, they'll tell you, when families are waiting for a doctor to come in to pronounce somebody as dead, yes, we pronounce them dead, but equally, five minutes later, we could just revive them again. So how do you really know when someone has actually died? What is that moment? And that has led to this huge blurring. It's really gray right now. There is no moment of death anymore. But in the old days, there was, because there's nothing you could do. And this led to a book by Sanjay Gupta, the CNN reporter, Cheating Death, which he's covered a lot more about this as well. But this is very important. And there's a whole array of science out there. And I won't go into the details because of time. But essentially, one of the main ones is cooling people. So if you can cool somebody, bring their temperature down by just a few degrees Celsius, you can preserve them for even longer. And so the case reports, just so you know, we have case reports of people who are dead for three or four hours and have been brought back to life again. So the question that comes to one's mind, of course, is, well, if you were dead for four hours, well, what happened to you, right? If I believe, again, going back to the Greeks, like Democritus, the Greek philosopher who believed that everything is made up of atoms, and that when you die, your soul or your psyche is also made up of atoms, and when you die, those soul atoms just disintegrate. They just disappear and they go away. So if there are people, and there are plenty of people you talk to who say, well, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it, right? There's nothing after that, right? And they talk to you as if it's absolute fact. They don't believe in reality is changing. For them, it's definitive, right? Well, that can't be true, because if he was dead for four hours, and he would have disintegrated, like Democritus would have believed, then he shouldn't have anything back when we bring him back to life again. There should be no mind, consciousness, or psyche. But that essentially is what we're finding now that we can reverse this. So I want to just point out a couple of things here. That Death is not philosophical. It used to be philosophical. Now it's a biological process. Okay, So people have philosophical ideas. Put those away. Let's talk about medicine here. Let's talk about biology. Let's talk about science. When somebody dies, and they can die from a multitude of different things. If I go on the street, I may be run over by a car, and I may bleed. I may have a hemorrhage. Right? Somebody 
may have cancer and it's overtaken their body. Somebody may have overwhelming infections, meningitis, right? And it overwhelms the body and eventually what happens, there's a pyramid. They have a heart attack. Now a heart attack can cause somebody to die. Eventually your body is doing everything it can and hopefully doctors are also working here to help to save you. But they get to a point where the heart no longer beats and it stops. That's a cardiac arrest. That is death. There's no difference. Those are two terms for the same thing. And then what happens, now in the old days there was nothing we could do because you know using a fireplace bellows or whipping and smoking and stuff didn't really help. So that was the end and that's why we would define death at this point. And even today in medicine we call this death. But what we've realized now is that there is a period in which death is reversible and it can be tens of minutes up to over an hour. And as I said, there are case reports of three or four hours of time in which we can reverse it. So arbitrarily, we say up to this point is life. And then when the, the heart stops and consequently the person stops breathing and their brain stops functioning because there's no blood flowing into the brain, then the doctor will come, they'll shine the light on the eyes and they pronounce somebody as dead, right? But that's just the beginning of a whole process that's going on afterwards. And this is the process of death that is reversible. So just to explain to you, think about it. If my heart just stops now, my brain cells start to undergo certain changes. They need oxygen, they need nutrients, and they start to undergo certain changes which take place over a period of a few minutes. Eventually, and this is very gray, if you don't get to me in time, then the damage to the brain cells becomes so significant that it becomes irreversible. Now, irreversible is also relative. Irreversible to today's science. We don't have the means to reverse it at that point. In 10 or 20 years' time, we might be able to reverse even those. But at some point, at any era, we can't reverse the changes that have taken place. And if you actually follow this process for you know, hours, days, and weeks, eventually, of course, you lose all the cells in your body and left with a skeleton. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, I'm a conscious thinking being, so what happens to my mind and consciousness during that period after my heart stopped and I went through death? And if we can intervene in this and we can reverse it, what does that really tell us? What does it mean? So just to explain a new concept that's really coming to me, which I find really interesting and fascinating, is that I don't think of death like most people, really. Death is completely reversible. And actually, death, from a biological perspective, again, put away the emotion, put away the philosophy. Death is just a stroke. That's all it is. It's a brain stroke. There's nothing more to it. Because let me explain. When somebody has a stroke, as I'm sure you know, what happens is you have a piece of clot okay, that goes into one of the blood vessels, and then the area of the brain that's supplied by that blood dies eventually. It gets damaged and eventually dies. Right? That's a stroke. Now, we also know that this is a period, this is a process, and we know that if we can give them clot-busting drugs within four and a half hours, we can reverse a lot of that damage to the brain. So for four and a half hours today, that we can reverse that process. Of. Now, that's for a regular stroke. When someone's died, the brain cells don't really care whether they're not getting oxygen because there was a clot or whether it was just because the heart isn't pumping it anymore. The end result is that the brain cells, now it's not a single region, it's of course the whole brain, so it's a whole brain stroke. But the brain is having a stroke. It's just going through the same biological changes as a regular person who's had a clot. And therefore, it is also reversible for many hours potentially afterwards if we can get to the person, if we do the right things. So what happens when someone has a stroke is, or, or dies, is that there is a lack of oxygen, ischemia, to the entire brain. But again, like a regular stroke, it's reversible. And what we know, and I'll briefly outline this for you, is that there is a very brief supply of oxygen, because oxygen itself is actually toxic. So there's a very s a limited supply of oxygen within the brain cells, which gets de depleted in two minutes. There are some energy stores in the brain cells. Cells just need energy and oxygen. They get depleted within about four minutes, OK, if you're not getting blood into it. And then the cells stop functioning. Um, and what you then have is calcium comes inside of the cells. The cell membrane, the wall of the cell gets disrupted. Calcium flows in, and it just starts to cause havoc, and it damages the brain cells. And that's what happens in a stroke or when somebody's died. And this, of course, as I said over and over again, happens over a period of time, um, and it can be reversed. So what we also know, which I'll just point out very quickly, is that even if we restart the heart in people, and I'm not going to go into this anymore, after they've died and we get them back to life again, there is a continued period of persistent brain injury, heart injury, and inflammation in the body that makes people die a second time. And so there's a whole science around that, preventing people from dying a second time. And that's a whole field that's being explored, which is very important. But I won't go into that for today. So now the big question that we're interested in is, OK, so death is a process. It's not a moment. It's like a stroke. We know that people who have strokes don't 
completely you know, lose their consciousness. So what happens to us when we die? Well, there's been very limited studies in this, unfortunately, because it's an area that's been underfunded and under, understudied. But it, the, the results are very interesting. There have been five independent studies carried out now that have looked at this. And they basically all demonstrate that 10 to 20% of people who have died and been brought back to life again will have some kind of memories from that period, suggesting that their consciousness, that entity that makes them into who they are, somehow continues for a period of time afterwards. And what I'm seeing from the studies that we're doing is that this is most likely because they forget. So probably more people, if not everyone's having the experience, it's just that when you ask them, they've forgotten it because of all the damage that's going on to their brain. It's the memory that's lost. And interestingly, some of them claim to be able to see and hear us when we're reviving them, even though to us they're dead, which is amazing because what it tells you is that entity of consciousness must be continuing if they can collect information about what's happening to them at that time. They have awareness which is why we call our study awareness, the AWARE study, which is awareness during resuscitation. And this is very much a scientific paradox because our current neuroscientific paradigms are that mind and consciousness is produced from the brain, and therefore when the brain doesn't function and you've gone through death, there should be no consciousness. They can't be together. Yet, paradoxically, and we're getting evidence that suggests that it does continue in people who've gone through death. And what they describe, and, and Jeff is going to talk about it in much more detail, what they describe is very similar to a classic near-death experience. And these, I have to tell you, are not near-death experiences. These are people who are dead. If anything, they're, you might call them an actual death experience or just mental activities of people who have gone through death. But essentially, <clears throat> they describe feeling very peaceful, seeing a bright light, seeing a tunnel, describing a sensation of going to a very beautiful place, maybe meeting deceased relatives, maybe meeting a being that's full of love and compassion, a being that's perfect to them. And then also <clears throat> an instantaneous panoramic review of their lives. Um, and some of them describe a sensation of separating from themselves, having a so-called out-of-body experience, looking down at what's happening to them, and then telling doctors and nurses what happened. And the doctors and nurses, of course, are completely baffled. And some of them try to ignore it. Some of them don't know how to handle it. But nevertheless, it happens. And there are many references to this. Um, the first study was carried out uh, by Albert Heim uh, in 1892, who was a Swiss mountaineer uh, who basically had a near-death experience himself when he fell off a mountain. He collected 30 cases of people who'd had similar events and found that they had similar experiences. Um, and then there's a painting from Hieronymus Bosch, uh, which we'll see here, which classically shows a near-death experience. And this is from somewhere around, I guess, around the late 1400s. Um, <clears throat> and what's interesting is that this is not typical of classical Christian ideas of what death is like. But he's drawn a tunnel with people being accompanied by these perfect angels going towards this very bright, welcoming light, which is what people describe. And there's also a reference in Plato's Republic. I'm not going to talk too much about near-death experiences because Jeff is going to do that. But just to say that it's been described from all over the world. And when you look at the different features, they're very similar from in different cultures. So for example, somebody who is a Hindu may have a near-death experience, and they describe seeing a being of light. They may describe that person as being um, uh, Krishna, or one of the Hindu gods. Whereas if a Christian has it, they may describe seeing Jesus. And if an atheist has a near-death experience, they may say, well, I don't know. I saw this beautiful being. I didn't know who he was, and I don't know why I had it, because I don't believe in anything. So that's how it is. So the interpretation of the di experience <clears throat> depends on the individual. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the, the uh, core features are similar. Maybe I should have a sip of water rather than torturing you. Thank you. Thank you so much. People don't describe frogs in their throats when they have near-death experiences. Not yet, anyway. And I also wanted to just say that <clears throat> we had this really interesting case of a child that was sent to us. So children have near-death experiences as well. And this was a child who had a cardiac arrest, who died for a period of time, was revived by an ambulance crew, and he drew this picture of himself. Now, this he wasn't even three years old. And it's amazing, because for adults, you could say that they have preconceived ideas of what life and death is like. But for a child who's not even three years old, they don't even understand what an afterlife is, let alone to be able to describe it. But he described this. When they asked him what this was, he said, that, oh, when, you di when I died, <clears throat> I, was, I saw this um, bright lamp. This was supposed to be the bright lamp, which he described instead of the light. And you're connected to it by a cord, or some sort of cord that he described. And many of the adults that I've interviewed have said the same thing, which is very interesting. And then when he met me, he drew this picture to describe himself in the ambulance looking down uh, at himself and, and describing what had happened. Then apparently he described like how a, a, the belt had come undone when they were trying to revive him in the ambulance, et cetera. Incredible details for a really, really small little thing. And there are a couple of cases that I've had myself. So 
This is an enigma because it challenges some of our most basic assumptions about our mind and of the brain and how they relate to, to each other. And this is really an age-old problem as well. Here's a gentleman who really likes himself, obviously, looking in the mirror, admiring himself, and then thinking, but who am I? And that's a question that we all have. We look at each other every day in the mirror. Who are we? Where do our thoughts come from? What are they? What's their nature? How can we develop them? And just to point out this problem, and I don't, you may be aware of this, forgive me if it's, if it's rep repetitive for you, but essentially, I used to believe, I really strongly believe that um, our mind and consciousness comes from the brain. I had no doubt about this. It was just made common sense, and how could it be any different, right? Until I started doing this research, and I started to question all the basic assumptions that I had myself. And what I realized was that, well, the brain is a fascinating organ. There's no doubt about it. But where is the mind? Where are our thoughts within this enigma of an organ? And when you break it down, you can see that it's made of tracts, like highways, that convey electricity to different regions. Like you could have different states in the US, and you have highways. The brain is similar. You convey information between different areas. But again, where in here are your thoughts, right? And here, if you break it down to even a lower level, you could individual brain cells. Where do thoughts come from? So for example, some of you, it's late, maybe tired, maybe think, God, he's talking so much. I'm tired. I want to go home. Hopefully not, of course. But anyway, if you were. The question is, why would your brain cells think that? How does that come to be? How can an individual brain cell have, or if you're hungry, how can it think, I'm hungry, I'm tired? It doesn't make sense. So if you were to look at an individual brain cell down a microscope, and I were to tell you, well, this brain cell is thinking, you know, I'm really jealous today. You'd say, crazy? It's a brain cell. It makes protein. It's, it can't do that, right? So then, why is it that if you put two cells together with a little bit of electricity, should you suddenly have this incredible phenomena of thought that we have? But we're all thinking beings. We all agreed. You all put your hands up earlier, right? And if you put hundreds together with a bit of electricity, where do your thoughts come from? Why should it be that a brain cell can generate thought? It doesn't make any sense to us. And that is the problem of consciousness in science today. It's a problem that Plato had, that Aristotle had, and people before him had as well. And we're trying to find out the answers to that too. So for example, if I were to throw a brick at my neighbor's window, why should my neuron feel guilty? I do, he didn't do it, right? So it's a problem. But also, if you believe, as a lot of people do, and I used to believe, that everything comes from the brain, then we shouldn't be accountable. We should not be accountable at all for anything that we do. There should be no lawyers, no judiciary, no legal system. Because you know what? My brain did it. I didn't do it. It was the neurons that did it, which doesn't make sense. Of course, this is a gross oversimplification. If you have certain damage to different parts of your brain, it can affect your psyche. It can affect your behavior, of course. But overall, you can see the problems that we face. And it's an age-old question. As I said, it started with even before the Greeks. Then we've had two different models from Plato to Aristotle. Descartes, probably the most famous Western person, believed that essentially mind is separate from the brain. It's a different, maybe a different entity. It's a different substance to the brain. And then as science progressed, we started to study the brain in more detail, and now culminating into scanning of the brain. And what we realize is that actually you can study people's thoughts when they're in a scanner and see what parts of the brain mediate those thoughts. And a lot of scientists have jumped to the conclusion that, oh, well, if this part of the brain lights up when you're thinking happy thoughts or jealous thoughts, then this means that these are all produced from those brain cells. But of course, it doesn't. It just tells you that that part of the brain is involved with that particular thought. Not that those cells can actually produce the thought. It doesn't make any, you still have that fundamental problem. And that's where we are. So we now understand we can map the brain and see what parts of the brain are involved with certain thoughts, but we don't know how they're produced. And there are multiple different views. The conventional views are essentially that, OK, although we as scientists don't understand how consciousness arises, we have to accept that it's somehow produced from the brain cells. We just don't know where, how. Okay? And there are many eminent scientists who believe this, including a Nobel Prize winner, Francis Crick, who was a co-discoverer of DNA. Susan Greenfield is a famous professor in England who is at the University of Oxford, a neuropharmacologist. And there are various other people as well. But others have also said, well, look, no matter how much we dig inside the brain cells, I don't think we can find it there. We should look at alternatives. And so some people have started to think of quantum physics to try to explain it through that. And what they say is that maybe instead of this relatively large brain cells that are connected together, you have to look at a smaller level, like the molecules, and then below the molecules, the level of the atoms, and below the level of the atoms. And maybe there's a process in there that's accounting for this. Again, it doesn't answer the question. It just takes it to a different level. And there are others who say that maybe the human mind and consciousness cannot ever be reduced down to brain processes. And we have to think of it as an irreducible entity, like mass or gravity in physics. And this is David Chalmers um, that Jim also mentioned uh, as well. And then there are others, other scientists, again, some very eminent. For example, Professor Sir John Eccles was a Nobel Prize winner as well, 
who believed ultimately the mind and consciousness have, are separate from the brain and bodily processes. They interact with it. And Professor Erlahi, who also lectures at the University of Sorbonne, has also in his works mentioned that as well. And there are various other people who say that too. So now I'm about to end. So forgive for your neurons. Forgive me if I, I overdid it a little bit, but just to explain something else here. Putting aside our personal views about what happens to our mind and consciousness when we die, etc., there has to be, of course, some process within the brain, somewhere in the brain, where this consciousness, our thoughts, exists and interacts with the brain, because we know it does. Of course, there's no doubt about that. We don't know exactly, but we have some very good ideas. There are particular pathways within the brain that we know mediate consciousness. If those pathways get damaged, then you lose your consciousness. So for example, if you go to have a surgery, thankfully, that exists. When they give you a general anesthetic, you lose your consciousness. You're not aware of what's happening to you because the general anesthetic, the medication, works on those particular pathways in the brain. No one knows exactly how, but somehow makes you lose your consciousness. Okay? So there are parts of the brain that are involved with at least the expression or awareness of our own consciousness. Does that make sense? And then we also know that if someone has brain injury, i.e. they go into a coma, those parts of the brain, again, become damaged, and they lose their consciousness, which makes perfect sense. So it can happen because they have had a lack of oxygen to the brain, like in the stroke that I talked about earlier, or because they've had bleeding or other processes that occurred. But now, if you think of cardiac arrest and death as also being the same process, it's a brain injury state, you can appreciate that when somebody dies, what happens is those areas of the brain, which general anesthetics may work on, lack of oxygen may affect, and various and drugs may affect, become inactivated, and therefore you lose your consciousness, you lose your awareness. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose it forever, in the same way that when the general anesthetic wears off, the person comes back again. When somebody who's in a coma is eventually treated, Sam Parnia hasn't been dissipated. His consciousness was still there. It was just lost for a period of time. Okay, maybe a few days, weeks, whatever it may be, but if you get those pathways working again, you can express that person again as an individual. And this is very important because if you think of the model I just explained to you about death and cardiac arrest being essentially a state of brain injury, there's really interesting evidence that's now coming out, um, which I won't go into detail, but just to point to you about people who've been in a vegetative state. And I'm sure you've heard about a lot of these really difficult ethical situations. These are people who've had brain injury, okay? They didn't die to the point where they completely, um, you know, went back again. But the parts of the brain that mediate their consciousness were damaged so much that they looked like a vegetable. Their brain stem was working, but the rest of the brain was so damaged that there was nobody there. And we all believed that those people were lost forever. People would say to their relatives, this person is a vegetable. There's nothing there, right? So we believed their consciousness had gone. And what's amazing in the last couple of years is that scientists have discovered, and this was the headline, uh, one of the headlines, of course, uh, in the New York Times a few months ago, that actually people who are in a vegetative state still have consciousness. So even though those parts of the brain have been completely damaged, if you can stimulate them somehow and learn the science around it, that conscious person is still there. Sam Parnia is still there, even though that part of the brain is, is, is completely damaged. And there was a really interesting study from Cambridge and Belgium that, was, that, that I won't go into details, but clearly showed that. They got the person who'd been in a vegetative state for many years to start thinking about certain things. And then with the scanners, they could see that actually his brain was lighting up when they were asking him questions. So for example, yes was, when they asked him to respond with yes, he obviously couldn't verbalize it. But they said, think about tennis. And they could show in his brain the areas that are involved with playing tennis were lighting up, suggesting that he understands what they're saying to him, even though he looks like he's not there. So this, for me, is incredible because we now know that people who've had a cardiac arrest, certainly for the first few hours after they've died, if we bring them back to life again, that conscious entity hasn't disappeared into thin air. And furthermore, people who've had similar damage to a selected part of the brain that involves consciousness for many years, their consciousness again hasn't lost. So just to finish, does this matter? Yes, it does matter. Because at one level, we can bring people back to life. And with the right technology, we can make sure that they don't have brain damage, that they can live fulfilled lives. This is Mr. Joe Tirolosi with one of my colleagues, Oren Friedman, who's an intensive care physician in New York. And he died for 47 minutes okay, at, at Cornell. And we got him back to life again. And in fact, believe it or not, he's here right now, sitting over there, okay, because he wanted to hear this, this presentation, which I'm very, very flattered that he came all the way with his wife. 
And what's important to understand is that without the right technology, without the right research, people like Mr. Tirolosi won't be here tonight. They won't be with their families. And so it's important, it's imperative for all of us to do this research, not only to save their lives, but also answer some of these fundamental questions about consciousness. So that's improving medical care. But also, if we discover that consciousness indeed does continue, what does that mean for us in terms of living our lives? If we know that death is not the end, what does that mean for us about the way we give meaning to our own lives and how we conduct ourselves? Furthermore, is there a way to develop this entity? Put aside the debate about where it comes from. We know we have this consciousness. In the same way that there's a science to develop medical consciousness, legal consciousness, artistic consciousness, is there a science to develop moral and ethical consciousness as human beings? And therefore, can we make ourselves better and also the world a better place? And finally, um, does this suggest, and I think it does, that there are certain things that are fundamental that bring us all together as human beings? And the study of consciousness in cardiac arrest is one of those. We're discovering that there are more things that unite us than separate us. And that's also very important. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons I so support the work of the Noor Foundation, which looks for the commonality amongst human beings. And so with this, I just want to thank you um, and just say whatever endeavor you have, whatever you want to do, just remember that consciousness is the most important thing. And you need moral consciousness to be good. Um, as a human being in life. Thank you very much.